We first move to the last contributor, uh, Max uh, Spielmann. He's a professor member of uh, Hyperwerk Institute of post, for Post-Industrial Design in Basel. He researches participatory media, commons, and new technologies. And of course, Max Spielmann is co-organizer of this conference. So, Max, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, workers invention question. Um, and that at the end of this day, I was thinking before how I come to the end and uh, Niels, you had given me the keyboard or the key person with, with boys. Um, because what I'm talking about in a, in a way is an anthropological shift. It's not about jobs and work and employment. It's about how do we understand our, uh, our combination, our uh, being in the world. And we went through centuries of separation. We have separated things, disciplines, places, segregation in cities. Here is work, places for work, here is places for living, here is places for uh, cinema or whatsoever. And uh, what I'm talking about, workers' invention, is thinking on this an end of separation, in a way. And what I will tell now is partly quite boring, because nothing is special, but when it comes together, I hope you will see why it's special in the combination. Now I start, workers' invention, by this title, why not invention of work, or future of work? As you know, this morning I've already introduced the circle of words which innovates social changes, and these changes innovate new kind, new understanding of work. The change of work is cause and consequence of work itself. Our traditional industrial understanding of work is wage work, having a job, being employed. And this kind of work will be reduced massively in the upcoming decades. Okay, work. So you see here, uh, before you all probably know the statement, that the next wave of automata automation will destroy up to 50% of today's jobs. Such a massive change is difficult to us to, to imagine. But you don't have to go far back to see such modifications. And you have here the slide. And the green is landwirtschaft, is agriculture. Here you see the changes in employment of the last 130 years for Germany. Let's look at this agricultural sector and go back even a little bit for, uh, more back. By 1800, about 80% of the population of Germany was working in agriculture, and hunger was commonplace in Germany. Today we have 3 to 4% which are working in agriculture, and hunger is no longer an issue. This is also true with different numbers worldwide. Perhaps 20% are working worldwide in agriculture and produce food for eight times more people than around 1800. Okay, hunger is still an issue on a global scale, but today this is primarily a problem of distribution and no longer of the volume of production. On the other hand, the amount of employees in the information sector, that's the blue one on the graph, the information sector, has increased from about 12% in 1880 to over 55% in these days. And precisely here and in the service sector, the automatization of the fourth international, uh, international, yeah, it's also international, the fourth industrial revolution will be effective. Of course, there is also a reduction in production. But this is not at the center of the expected mutation. And that's important. We always see the robots in the factories. The next revolution is not about the robots in the factories. That's not over, but it's not the core issue. It's about services. There is, some, uh, for example, one 
quite a, a clever uh, scientist and with a good reputation said so in an interview a year ago, a global bank, which in these days 100,000 employees, could be run with 1,000 employees as far as long as there is no uh, service station, there is no uh, bank where you are going. It's, if you have everything automatic, it's, we don't need a lot of people. Um, so, we have a problem. And the economy does have a solution, as always. Uh, with a new wave of growth, enough new jobs will be created, and that's the solution. But exactly this leads to another problem. What you see here, the problem is the limits of growth. What you see here is a representation from the year 1956. It's one of the first graphs of a so-called resource peak. Here it's an oil peak, and in principle, current diagrams look exactly the same. We live far above the conditions given by nature. Switzerland now uses slightly more than three Earths. That is two Earths more than we should use for sustainability. In Greece, this ecological footprint came down since the economic crisis to about two Earths. That means we are also here still one Earth above what we are allowed to, if we look for long term. An end of growth and for industrialized countries, a massive post-growth will sooner rather than later become a necessity for survival. Our only choice is, can we change this by design or only by disaster? Now, of course, we are addressing this post-growth with the fear of a reduction of our own individual prosperity, a massive reduction in our consumer behavior only makes consumption happy. Three, prosperity without growth. To the all clear, with a fair distribution of wealth, and that's a huge problem, I know, these fears are actually not valid. Here is a statistic by Tim Jackson, the author of Prosperity Without Growth. It shows the relation between having a happy life that's the epsilon. And the gross domestic product, the GDP per capita, that's the X. It, um, and we recognize something which is almost, and that's really surprising, identical in similar statistics on life expectancy or education level or child mortality. Down to one-fifth of the GDP per capita of the richest, richest countries, happiness or life expectancy, etc., remains roughly the same. Such statistics, of course, give a lot of reason for discussion and questioning. But I'm only concerned about size orders here. And there, a clear statement is possible. The relationship between prosperity and income is not linear at all. Or, in other words, there is a good possibility of prosperity without growth. <coughs> we have to reduce production and consumption, and that leads to less wage work, wage labor. Fourth, what is work at all? As mentioned in the beginning, we do need another understanding of work. What kinds of work exist besides of wage work? What we see here is a graph of the time usage in minutes per day for German women and men in the year 2002. On the left, women. On the right, men. We have it in German, but uh, you may get an impression of the differences. We see different types of work, like educational work, household work, cooking and cleaning, or voluntary work. And we see the massive difference between the genders. Unfortunately, a not surprising result. What I want to show is quite simple. Job work is only a part of what we are working every day. However, our self-understanding is usually defined by wage work. And for many, 
Having no job means really having nothing to work. Only too often, unemployment is followed by depression and lethargy. Why? Of course, unemployment is sooner, sooner than later linked to personal economic problems. And this is a huge problem, for sure. Nevertheless, I do have another aspect in mind. With or without a job, there are enough problems out there in the social world which demand for active people. Why means no job, automatically no work. Wage work is constitutive in the definition of our social position, the social field in which we live, the habitus that we have acquired and incorporated throughout our life. Wage work is constitutive for our identity. Selling our labor force is too often our only freedom in the context of work. The self-understanding of work as being active for others, being active in social and cultural networks, this understanding is rusty. Fifth, five, five. <coughs> what can design and art do? In, in his work, The Rise of the Creative Class, and coming a little bit to you, but going in the other direction. Uh, in, his work, in his work, The Rise of the Creative Class, Richard Floyd has worked out the creative class as or the key factor of the growth of cities. This is because creatives are always looking for new solutions, innovations or new products and services, new forms of work environments and work structures. This is also because creatives are often forced out of precarious situations to act like this. So creatives have a tendency to invent work and perhaps also to understand work as invention. Richard Florida's work is about prosperity and growth of cities. Our intention is transformation. If Richard Florida speaks of talents, tolerance and technology as the three basic conditions for economically successful cities, then we are talking about the same three T's for social transformation, a fourth T, a transformation that will deeply interfere with our individual or collective and social structures. The question is for what goals we invest our creativity. And now I come to consequences on laboratory on our project. Finally, I like to come back to laboratory. As we have seen, our approach to work is an understanding of work as self-determined way of being active, an understanding which is open-minded and heads for social in invention. Therefore, laboratory will be a self-organized laboratory of work, has to be a self-organized laboratory. An exemplaric topos for the extension of local and regional circulation, of working with and in the neighborhood, which works on redefining the commons, works with low investment, creates other kinds of microeconomy, like sharing, exchange or alternative currencies. It's about building up local capacities, up even to high qualified work. To realize this, we have we plan three basic loops. In the first loop, we have to define the fields of work and the fields of production and distribution we are heading for. We search mainly in the fields between design and craftsmanship, like the Fab Lab you mentioned before. Fields where with new di digital technologies, <coughs> the gap between design, draft and production will close, the separation in between here is the drafting and here is the production. That will close again after more than 100 years of industrial forced separation. This research is neither bottom-up nor top-down. It's associative. It's a mapping of competences, resources, interests and potential. I will be the first where we hear <laughs> music. Uh, you remember the maps Jean van Heswick has shown at the end of here of her video input. It's exactly this kind of mapping we'll use to understand the situation. That is important. I'm fed up with evaluations, which are just a work of legitimation for the money which we all spend in a project. I'm also fed up with any verification 
of positive or sometimes negative results. We are here in a loop doing projects without the research on what we are really doing and developing theses, medium range theories of how we have or we could go on. That's the, this really this evaluation stuff I have it's really here, where we just do the like imitation work and never have time to research on what is really the point. The second loop is about expanding here. Expanding to other disciplines of work and including more persons into laboratory. And the third loop is about extension to other institutions, creating spin-offs, for example. These loops are all on sharing knowledge. And as you know, knowledge is one of the rare resources which multiplies by sharing. Now to escape from the piano, I come to the end. Perhaps you can listen a little bit. Um, you have seen, I'm, I know I'm in a way in a quite antagonistic situation. I'm talking about not creating new jobs, what everyone wants. But I, I, I talk about a new way of understanding work. And this has a lot to do with this end of separation and for sure, it's, if, we ha if we think of laboratory, it's this, this search of the gap the devil le has left. That's not by me, that's by Alexander Kluge. Meaning where we have this small part where we could go on, work together, finding ways of having a, li a life, making a living for which is earning money in English, but not this kind of trying to create industrial jobs. They will not come. Okay, thank you for your attention.